And because he's distracted by his Alzheimer's disease and because he's distracted by his guilt around the crime that he's involved in, one day he starts wandering from his assigned route. He wanders into corridor M. And all of a sudden, the building picking up his movement, knowing where he is, knowing where he's gone wrong, the building goes crazy. And an audible announcement is broadcast over the public address system. Arnold Chapel, return to corridor K. Arnold Chapel, please return to corridor K. That was the social control measure that the system had designed into it. And I laughed when I read that because I thought, you know, that is exactly, yes, this is science fiction, but that's exactly how engineers think. You know, and, and I'm willing to take some responsibility for that as well. Like some intervention has been made that causes him to return to his route. But then I thought, was it really necessary to humiliate the guy like that? What you really want is for him to go back to his assigned route. And for the moment, I'm not going to question whether or not we want machines assigning us anything, even if it's something as trivial as a work route. But in this context, all we really wanted was for Arnold Chapel to go back to Corridor K. We didn't need to broadcast his incompetence to the entire hospital. We didn't need to embarrass him in front of his peers. We didn't mean to shame him. That's what the system did. It could have been designed, and it should have been designed better, so that it just possibly communicated with him audibly, or possibly even physically tapped him on the shoulder, or lit up a sign that only he could see in his field of vision so that he did return to the route, but it wasn't audible to everybody else. So yeah, I don't think ubiquitous systems should embarrass us. Again, <laughs> shame, concept wildly different from culture to culture, so it's something that is, has to be subject to a local discussion and a local recognition of what it means. All I ask is that we make these things explicit because the nature of capitalism in these days is that a system designed in Finland can be marketed in Korea, and a system designed in Japan can be marketed in the United States. And since these places all have different ideas and cultural values, anything that the designer brings to it that they haven't examined and considered and thought about gets instantiated in the system at a very deep level of architecture that is not therefore amenable to review or change by the user. And that's going to cause difficulties. Because if a system that's designed to accommodate a Japanese sense of shame is delivered to a user in the United States, or if a system that is designed to accommodate a Finnish user's sense of safety is delivered to a user in Korea, we're going to have issues. We're going to have breakdowns. Our systems should be designed so that they default to harmlessness, so that they disclose themselves, so that they save face, and so that they save time. Ubiquitous systems must not introduce undue complications into ordinary operations. And what I mean by this is precisely that I want to avoid the model that has descended to us from the PC. When I set up a pot of water to boil to make tea, I do not want my stove to say, it looks like you're trying to boil a pot of tea. Would you like help with that? When I get into the shower in the morning, I don't want there to be a blue screen of death when I try to turn the hot water on. When I put on a sweater, I don't want the sweater to crash before it works. I think ubiquitous systems cannot be designed in the ways that we've designed systems previously because they will waste, they will burn our lifetime. They will burn our lifetime like a bonfire because you're just going to you're you're going to try to do something simple in your environment, something that you already know how to do. And some system is going to step, it is going to interpose itself, it is going to intervene between you and the object of that transaction. And it's going to try and help you, and it's going to drive you crazy because you didn't need help. So that we need to design ubiquitous systems so that they recognize that an adult, competent user knows and understands what they want to achieve and has accurately expressed that desire to the systems around them. Now you're already thinking, because you're brilliant people, you're already realizing that this, there's some conflict between this and principle one. How can a system both do what I, I want it to do when I've expressed it simply and protect me? What if I've turned my stove up to 700 degrees? You know, what if I want it really hot in there? Well, isn't the system under some pressure to also default to harmlessness, to refuse to act in such a way as would harm me? I will admit to you that this is an unresolved question. I will admit to you that there is tension in between these principles. And I will admit to you that there are occasions on which observing one of these principles means not observing another to the fullest degree. 
and yet I think that they're all necessary. The last of them, though, is the deepest and the most challenging, and it's the hardest. It, it's, it's simultaneously the simplest to explain and the hardest to achieve, and what that is, I think ubiquitous systems must, as an absolute ethical imperative, be deniable. We must have the ability to opt out of them always and at any point so that if you're in public space or if you're in private space and if your actions and operations are engaging systems that you do not wish them to be engaging, you have the absolute right to say no and there should be no penalty other than you just can't use whatever that system was trying to help you with. The reason that this is so difficult is because it, it implies that there has to be some kind of alternative pathway towards success and that that's not a trivial thing at all. I will give you an example that may explain what I mean. In Manhattan right now, it is already impossible to walk through the core of Manhattan Island without falling under the view of a surveillance camera. There's a very interesting student project called Critical Cartography, which maps not merely the location of every camera in the city, but also their field of view and who owns that camera. And if I wanted to use that map to plan a route for me that would get me from point A to point B, I mean, let's say I want to go from my house at 30th Street to my favorite coffee house at 18th Street, and I'd like to be able to walk there without falling under the view of one of these cameras. Well, the only way that I can do that is to literally walk to the river and know that I'm going to be under the cameras the entire time I'm walking to the river, then walk around the outside of the island about seven miles, and then pick up the river on the opposite side. That eliminates most of the camera views I'm under. That's not acceptable. That's not a meaningful alternative. That is not a practically meaningful alternative. So that already I'm essentially, as a user, as a citizen, as a human being, I'm already compelled to engage these surveillance systems when I walk through my own city. And these are just, for the most part, visual cameras and microphones. I'm not even talking about biometric stuff, and I'm not talking about anything that's as elaborate as the ubiquity that we've discussed. There needs to be a lot of thought and attention to making meaningful alternative pathways to success for the part of people who do not wish to engage ubiquitous systems. This is the principle that I think is hardest to observe. It's the one that I think is going to get ignored the most. It's the one I think is going to get left behind the most. But I nevertheless think that it's critical because, and here I will tell you something personal about me. Um, I, I practiced Buddhist meditation. And to the degree that I have any spiritual practice at all, this is something I believe in very deeply. And I spend a lot of effort. I, I've meditated every morning for 15 years without fail, without missing a single day. And the reason I do that is because it's very important to me to be present, to be fully present in this one lifetime that we all are given. And being fully present to me requires that it not be augmented, that my, react my relationship with something not be clumsily augmented with some imposed informational screen. There are experiences that I wish to have in this lifetime whether they're experiences of intimacy with my family and friends, whether they're experiences of the natural world, I do not wish to have an informational overlay appended to them. It's, it's just something that's beyond words. It's beyond argument for me either. It just seems to be a complete ethical and spiritual even prerogative that we allow ourselves to have this original world so that when we want to avail ourselves of all of the things that ubiquitous computing can do for us, we're able to, but we can switch out of that mode at will. I understand that's a personal perspective and it's not going to be particularly convincing to a lot of people and particularly to either engineers or the people who fund the systems that we're discussing. But I wouldn't think that this discussion was complete if I didn't offer it at the very least. For further discussion, um, I've written this book and all of the themes that we've discussed today are in this. Um, they are treated in somewhat more depth, but I will be honest with you, the book is a survey. It's meant to be wide. It's meant to be broad. It's meant to be an overarching view of the state of development. It is not meant to be an in-depth engagement to every topic that it addresses. I hope that that in-depth engagement is something that emerges with the conversation that starts here and now. 
And I have one copy of the book for some lucky person in the audience, whoever gets to me first at the end of everything, after the panel discussion and after the Q&A, whoever gets to me first gets the book. I apologize that it's in English. I'm currently negotiating for a Japanese edition, for a Korean edition, for a French edition. I hope they're out soon. They're not at the moment. So in the meantime, this is the best you're going to get for what it's worth. I thank you very, very much for your time, your audience, your attention, your coming in the rain, and your engagement. Um, I think the rest is up to you. So I wish you gambate, good luck, and please keep in touch with me and let me know what you devise and you decide and you develop as you move through the world of ubiquitous computing. Thank you very much.